Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DMV Business Show. I'm your host, Odo Sevilla, and today I have a very special guest for you, Kiana. Kiana Jones is the founder and executive director of Congress Heights Arts and Culture Center. Welcome to the show. Yes, thank you for having me, Odo. It's a pleasure. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself? I'm pretty good. I can't complain. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you again for coming on. Absolutely. Um, so it, before we go into your personal story, Kiana, if you could give the audience just a general overview of the organization, what they do, who you are. Yeah, absolutely. So Congress Heights Arts and Culture Center, um, affectionately known as the Center. We are an art gallery, first and foremost. We promote and support Black and Brown artists. We also do programs and workshops, and then we triple, we're a triple threat as rental space for small businesses and for the community as well. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, a little bit of everything, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that. And, and where are you folks located? Yeah, we're right at 3200 MLK, which is in Ward 8 um, of D.C. Um, we're right up the street from Baloo High School and down the street from MLK Deli, a couple big landmarks over here. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sure, you know, I don't know if this, what you thought of when you were a child, Did, are you originally, by the way, from the DMV area? Here I am a native born and raised in Southeast. Yes. Ah, DC. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, what you were mentioning, uh, it wasn't, it was never a, a thought or a dream of mine to be very honest. Um, I tell people all the time that the center kind of self manifested based on who, who I was as a child and what I needed as a child. Um, I kind of grew up as a weirdo because I never realized I was a creative. In Southeast, we are, we don't have all the resources. You know, we're a little underprivileged over here and left behind um, a part of the city. So when I was growing up, it never, never had anything that nurtured the spirit of a creative. So I never realized, oh, you're just an artist. Um, until I left and had opportunities to go to school uptown and had those resources and different things. But it just always made me wonder, like, why don't we have this in Southeast? Um, and yeah, there was a lot of, I'm sure that we'll get into a lot that happened um, in between that. But yeah, the center is just a safe place for, for what we need over here. You know, there's a lot of things that we go through um, and we have to deal with on this side. So outside of it being, you know, like that necessary space where we can express ourselves, we're teaching people that the starving artist thing doesn't have to be real. You can become economically stable. So there's a lot of pieces that we, you know, that we add into the community. I love that. So growing, growing up in Southeast, uh, you yeah. said you were creative. What were you into, the arts or music? Do you remember? Yeah, I was just always... Well, I'm always was always into fashion. So like trying to make my clothes or just like wearing different things. And then I always love to draw. So I didn't really know that I was artistic, um, like artistically inclined until, like I said, I got to a school where those resources were available mm -hmm. and I was able to play around and stuff. Um, but definitely was a complete art kid to the point they were using my art for like brochures at school or Christmas cards to send out and mailers and stuff like that. So oh, yeah, wow. definitely. Yeah. Very artistic. <laughs> That's nice. And, and all this art being used, was this back in elementary school or yep, junior yep, high early, school? Yep. Early as um, elementary school. And that was, that's the sad part for me. Once I got to high school, you know, you have to do electives and art was considered an elective. I ended up doing Spanish and ROTC. So I ended up leaving art behind literally from high school all the way until I created the art gallery in 2015. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess growing up there in DC, I, you know, in your free time, is it just art or were you into other things as well? No, I definitely was like a little mini jock. I did a lot of sports. Um, I did basketball. I ran track. Um, I did gymnastics for about five years. I thought I was going to be the next Dominique Dolls for a while. Um, but yeah, definitely active. And then my mom was really... Um, influential and in just how I, uh, I approached art and how I saw art and loved art. She used to take me to all the museums. So definitely going to the museums and looking around and seeing everything and just getting really inspired. I, I'm curious, is there any family there as far as artists or anything like that? I'm the only artist in the family from what I know. My dad is um, a big art collector. Um, okay. He's also, you know, like my partner at the center. Um, but for the most part, I'm... Pretty much it. Now that I think about it, my mom was pretty artistic. Like as I was growing up, helped me with my science projects and stuff like that. And she would like help draw, but she doesn't, she doesn't take it seriously, but she's okay. pretty good actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you said around high school, you said that's when you went uptown and um, you, you, I guess you transitioned from going to public schools in Southeast to Northwest. Yep, absolutely. So I kind of bounced back and forth. I actually went to 
um, Montessori in Georgetown. Um, then I came back to Southeast and was at um, Beers Elementary, which is a DC public school. And my kids actually go there now, which isn't too far for, from my house in Ward 7. Um, I stayed there for two years, uh, first and second grade. And then I went back to Georgetown and went to Holy Trinity um, um, School and was there all the way until eighth grade and then went to St. John's College High School after that. Um, so pretty much stayed uptown once I like once I came up there, but then it was also like always had to come back home. Right. And mm -hmm. then just trying to figure out just trying to like understand everything because I would get made fun of for going uptown and the uniform that I wore and people said that I talked a lot different, um, which I learned to be I just spoke educated, um, <laughs> which was different at the time. Right. Um, but then also having to deal with um, my friends not being able to do sleepovers because they found out their parents found out I lived in Southeast. Right. And just trying to figure out, like, what is the problem here? Because I've always loved Southeast and I've always seen the beauty in it. So it always confused me once, you know, I heard the bad stuff from other people. St. John's and Military Road, right? Yes, on Military yeah. Road. Yes. I, I have a good friend who graduated from there, too. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty good school. I, I, I had a good time there. I definitely will say that. Yeah, that's good. I'm sure it was different, I guess, living in Southeast, going to school, being exposed to different things there, right? Yeah, it was really hard. It was really confusing. Um, I had to take a, like an hour and a half bus every day um, to go uptown before I started doing, you know, my mom started letting me get on the um, on the train. But yeah, I just was completely confused because you know, even we're a food desert. Now we're starting, you know, with gentrification and development coming. There's different things that we're seeing now. But for the most part, we didn't have any restaurants. We didn't have to see any eateries. So I'm just riding, you know, this bus as a little girl, like looking at all these places and all these big buildings. And it's like, why don't like you literally come across the bridge and there's nothing? Why? Yeah. <laughs> How would you end up going to St. John's, by the way? Um, good question. So I applied to all these different schools. I applied to um, McNamara as, um, as well. I really wanted to go to school without walls and like got the whole process, which is pretty rigorous. And last minute, my mom was just like, you're not going there, you're going to St. John's. And really, this is a funny story. What really made me want to go to St. John's, there was this movie back in the day on Disney Channel called Cadet Kelly. And she was in ROTC and she was swinging the guns and everything. She was on drill team. And I was like, I want to do that. And that's literally why I, I think I decided on St. John's uh, because I wanted to spin some guns. <laughs> uh, and you did join R JROTC. Yep, so you, I did. I did join ROTC. Um, I did, was able to do like the cherry blossom parades. Um, I did do the drill team unarmed and armed. So I did get to flip some guns every now and then. Um, so it was a good time. And I just learned a lot. Um, in ROTC, just about discipline, um, you know, like ironing my shirt, like some of the little things that you kind of, you can miss out on. Um, yes. So it was really, it was a good experience. When I got to senior year, I was like, I went out, but <laughs> it was definitely <laughs> still a good experience. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I grew up in DC and I remember, I don't know how it is back, uh, how it is now, but back then, if you were into the arts for high school, you either went, you mentioned school without walls or mm -hmm. Duke. Or Duke Ellington, yeah. exactly. Those yeah. were, I guess, your top two choices for, yeah. for public high school in D.C. Yeah, and I say, and like, at that point, art was just more fun for me. I just yeah. never thought that it could be something that I'm doing now, right? Like, full time. I never thought of that as something I could do. It just was something that was fun. So I really got into um, writing and poetry was really what I, like, spent a lot of my time doing. Um, off of seriousness. I ended up going to University of Maryland and getting my, my first degree in uh, broadcast journalism. And so I was a journalist for years before I even like really got back into the artistry. Oh, that's great. You went to here at the one in College Park? Yep. Oh, awesome. Philip I, I didn't know you were a, a Terp alumni. Go Terps. Yep. Go Terps. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you said you did broadcast journalism in, in here in Maryland? Yep, did broadcast journalism, um, end up leaving and went to um, ABC 7, Channel 7, Channel 8, worked there. Um, I was pregnant with my daughter there, so end up leaving, having her, and then I returned back into the journalism field, but through radio. Um, I worked as a producer with CBS Radio, um, WNEW, which was the all news station. It has since been bought by Bloomberg, but was there working for about four years as um, a full-time producer and ended up getting two Edmore Awards. So 
Yeah, I got a little stuff on him about. Wow, congrats. <laughs> Thank you. That's bro, though. He's, I guess he wanted to be in the show. Yeah, he, he, he needs his time in the spotlight, too. Right. <laughs> For those of us only listening, it, it, it's her dog, by the yes, way. Yes, <laughs> my puppy, Rolo. He's a cutie. Yeah, okay. So then after that, what happened? Um. So I worked in, so I was at the radio station. This is kind of how I segued. Um, mm-hmm. And my daughter's father, well, I have two children now. My children's father, he's a full-time artist. Um, went to school for art, like always knew he was going to do art, always did it. Um, and I was working at the radio station and it was a Navy Yard shooting that day, which is actually what I got one of my um, Ed Moore Awards from. And that night I ended up um, dropping my daughter to her father because I was just like, just had a long day. It was super crazy. Um, in the middle of the night, um, well, that night, not in the middle of the night, Sean which is my kid's father, he went to um, the store to get something, but he was on a skateboard. He ended up getting hit by a Yukon truck. um, And it just threw all of our lives into shambles. Um, He survived, uh, believe it or not, lost a couple of, you know, insides, but survived, uh, made a full recovery. But at at that time, I was in grad school. I was trying to do the radio thing. We were co-parenting and it just was a lot. Um, so I ended up going part-time at the radio station and then working with my father um, full-time. Um, and that's how I kind of got to Southeast. So the space that we're in, the center, 3200 MLK, my father used to work there. Um, and before that, my siblings grew up there. Um, and so my father ended up renovating space across the street to make more office space and the house became available. Um, and Sean was looking for all these places where he could do a solo exhibition. And as most artists know, doing a solo exhibition is very hard and it's very rare unless you're like really popping um and so this house was open i was like this would be the perfect spot we can make this an exhibition space and my father's like okay and i was like we should probably just do that long term because i don't want to keep working for you like i want to do something different it's just too stressful so he was like kiana we live in the hood people are not this is not going to work just being an art gallery like you're not going to survive like how are you going to keep the lights open and on and so i was like um well, we do cl- programs and workshops. And then that way we can teach people art. Maybe we can, you know, um, charge for some classes. But then at the same time, we're teaching the value and the power of art, right? And he's like, yeah, that's a little bit better, but what else? And I was like, okay, fine. We'll still do the, the rental and the property thing like you like, because um, that's his jam. And that's kind of how we started. We opened the doors in 2015 um, and just start rolling after that. Wow, so seven years ago. Seven years ago. I literally cannot believe it. I mean, COVID made three years go super fast. But yes, we've been open for seven years. It's crazy. What were you doing with your daddy? You said you were working with him and his business? Yeah. So my father, he's a developer, but he's also, um, he has properties all over from commercial to, to um, you know, residential. And mm-hmm. so I was basically his property manager. Okay. And I'm an empath. I'm really energy sensitive. So it was like really bothered me that people were calling. It was like, I have a hole in my roof and it's raining. And it's just like, oh, I got to get back to you in a couple of days. I could not take it. So this was like the perfect segue um, for me to get out of that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that, that's good. So you renovate then the center, right? And then you, you, you do, what do you, how does it look before you got in compared to now? Yeah, so like I said, it was a complete residential house. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, my, like I said, my siblings grew up there. Then my father ended up transforming it into his business space before he moved across the street. Um, so it was like a regular house. Even okay. when we opened in 2015, um, we stayed that way up until about 2017. Um, but you come in, like literally looks like a regular house. Um, but now we've renovated 2017. My father got his hands in it because I guess he saw that I was doing a pretty good job and he was happy with how things were moving. Um, and we like tripled the space. So now that we have a first floor that has two rooms, um, complete um, gallery downstairs, a full functioning kitchen. There's two offices on the first floor as well. Um, two big old bathrooms. We have a second floor that serves as our workshop space. Um, we have about five offices on that floor uh, for small business and art studio space. And then on the third floor is just all business space. Um, there's a big conference center up there. I mean, conference area up there and about four more offices. And then we have an amazing rooftop, which is like, I think we're the only one that have a rooftop in Southeast, but it's the best. It's the cherry on top, I call it. Yeah, that's where the parties happen. 
that's where the party <laughs> is happening. Yeah, we had <laughs> yoga up there. We've done silent discos. Um, we've done sipping paints. I mean, really, we use every part of the space that we can when we can. I love that. Are, are you are you the only type of organization like this in Southeast? Um, so not the, well, we are, yes, we are one of a kind. There's nobody like us. Like I said, that, that three piece that we offer, um, mm -hmm. especially space for the, the community to rent, um, and to be a house and the art gallery, but there are other art spaces that are not too far from us, um, in Anacostia that we collaborate, um, with every now and then, okay. but for the most part, we are the only one like us in Connors Heights. Yes. So how do you start, you know, to get the word out there, especially that this is a new, this is a new type of thing in the neighborhood and yeah. the community, right? Yeah. It's one of the things, honestly, I still struggle with, right? Um, because we still are, we, we still have a lot of things that we have to prioritize over art, right? But then we've, we've been really able to tap in to the artists in our community, right? So we started uh, a brand called Southside Creative, which actually, sorry, listeners, you can't see it, but I'm wearing it. Um, it says Southside Labs Matter, but the brand is called Southside Creative, which means a different kind of creative. And I think people just resonate with that. You know, um, Southeast is just a different part. I always think about like, if you say Southeast of the Detroit or Southside of Chicago, everybody like Southside is very specific, right? Um, so I think just that knowing that um, the place is for us and by us, for me being here, um, born and raised. I know what we like, I know what we don't like. Um, so it just feels like family. Um, I think the biggest part is just telling people because we still look like a house on the outside. Um, so people are kind of confused about what we are, um, just looking from the inside out. So we've gotten, you know, big signs and, you know, um, awnings that have our name on it. But I tell people all the time, because people are always like encouraging me to make it look more artsy outside which I'll consider maybe like we may paint the gates or something like that. But I really like the juxtaposition that happens, right? You're outside on this busy corridor. You got a house that's just like, what is happening in there? And then you go inside and you are just overwhelmed with beautiful art from all over the world. And it's just like, I had no idea. And then again, it's legacy space. So like the history, the energy, the vibes are really real. Like, and I decided not to, um, I made like a conscious choice not to go virtual during the pandemic because I was like, you cannot, you can't get this vibe virtual. You have to be in the space. You have to feel it. And so, yeah, it's getting the word out can be a little bit tricky. Um, but I just show my face and I'm in the streets and I'm like, have you heard about the center? And they're like, what? Oh, that building on the corner across the street from the fire station. I'm like, yeah, that's me. Come see me. So okay. we're, we're growing. I mean, like when you think about business, right? seven years you're just now coming out of like your toddler stage and so i think we're just really in a good spot now we've built the momentum we've planted the seeds so now it's like time to see everything bloom yeah that's true but business it's a it's a long game for sure yes absolutely yeah so when people come in all right you know i guess the marketing is more like grassroots you're in the streets there maybe handing out flyers or some absolutely. material to get the word out in the community to come there, come take a look, come visit, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. What's there? Is it, you mentioned classes. So uh -huh. are these classes that people may sign up to learn about a specific type of art? Yeah, for sure. So we've, we're now just getting the ball rolling now that the pandemic has seemed to chill out a little bit. Um, so we have yoga class. Um, and so first of all, let me just preface that all of the classes, majority of the classes that we do, we offer, I say, for ages one, uh, five until 105, because I honestly feel like art is for everybody, right? It's that universal language that you can tap in wherever you are in your life. So just wanted to say that. So yes, definitely have yoga classes. We've had stained glass class before. We like literally are breaking up the glass and the instructor is teaching you how to like create your own piece. Um, that was an incredible class. I, I should probably bring that back. We've had screen printing class um for the kids and for the adults of course we have a sip and paints you can book those and then we host them every now and then um what else have we had we've had sewing classes um we've had chakra healing classes so we do a lot of stuff about healing and emotional wellness and mental um and mental wellness um 
we we literally do anything and i mean that's the other that's the other beauty of it for the most part i'm a one woman band so if you call the phone you're going to get me if you email the website is me the twitter the instagram everything is me right um and so in the beginning i was really burning myself out the first couple of years of the center like trying to create all this programming by myself and trying to host it and then i realized there's so many other organizations that do amazing program and need space and so that's kind of where we collaborate we started to collaborate with people right so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel we can just get with people and offer all these these um these different things so that's what we are now and so outside of my mind all these people that are doing things i can't even tell you like the options and programs that we'll have coming up that's great I, I, i'm glad you just mentioned this as far as other organization it sort of clicked for you there so that means other businesses or other organizations are coming and just using your space absolutely for, uh, one type of that type of thing yep i mean a multitude of things we have um we have some tenants that come in and, and use our space for their like their monthly meetings um, for example, we have meeting mm -hmm. space um, that people can come in. We have some co-working space if people want to come in just for a couple of hours and do things. Um, yeah, people have their events. Uh, we've had birthday parties, bridal showers, visuals, memorials. I mean, literally anything that you can think about, you can come in and, and use the space for. Yeah. And then, of course, like other organizations, um, we collaborate with them and offer actual programming, right, where you can come in and do classes and stuff like that, too. Oh, I love that. Are you are you still also a, a sort of a, a one man band doing everything yourself? I am. Oh my so gosh! Yes, if you're listening, we need volunteers. <laughs> we need support. And like you know, and so the thing about it is, most people always think it's nonprofit. Like we can only like give them money, like write them a check. Uh -huh. We love any kind of services, people. Like we love that. So if you're an accountant that you know wants to get some uh some service hours come visit us if you just want to clean up you like we literally will take anything so please come see us <laughs> like I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm so versed in saying we but it's literally just me yeah yeah uh, i i i use we a lot too people are just like hold on um yes i use yeah <laughs> exactly but it works like for me it works really well when i'm going um for grants and everything right and i get to be there especially when i get to like speak to them in person and i'm telling about all these wonderful things that we're doing and then i stop and i have to tell them i lied a little bit and they're like what did you lie about i was like i said we this whole time it's just me and then they're like oh yes we have to give you money we have to give you money <laughs> <laughs> oh i love that <laughs> You know, I, I'm thinking for like high school students or college students, maybe they need some community service hours and they can learn a ton. Hours. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely do that. And we've collaborated um, with the city with the um, Marion Berry Youth Summer Program. Mm -hmm. And so we've had we've gotten some staff that way um, through our teams over the um, over the summer. So we'll probably sign up for that again this summer. That's great. Yeah. What, 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 what would you say drives and motivates you? um it's my community like i said i'm born and raised here and i just know what we deserve um and so it's like now people are starting to see us because of the development and the gentrification and just like this beauty was always here right and so and i just feel like i am that tangible example of like the beauty of southeast and like the the high caliber of what can come out of southeast we always hear so many negative things about southeast and the things that are happening in here but there's some really beautiful things and i feel like i'm a perfect example so that's my south side drives me i love i love south side what do you think was before that people were missing it and now they're coming to realize after all this time all the all the beautifulness that's there I just think they were afraid, like just the, the things that they've heard. And then you literally, that bridge really does like cross us off away from everybody, right? So it's like crossing that bridge. I don't know if I want to go over that bridge. I don't know what's over there, right? It's like, as far as they, most people will come as Capitol Hill for getting that, that is actually Southeast as well, right? Um, but I think, and realistically, and just frankly, we were the last spot to, to take. Mm -hmm. the rest of dc was built up and so they literally had no choice but to come over here and then when they came over it was like whoa this is what's here <laughs> right like i think one like i live in the hillcrest neighborhood in ward seven um so i bounce between ward seven and ward eight and there's a lot of history here right even in ward ward eight you have congress heights and berry farm that was a part of like war spaces that people don't know about um and then over here in hillcrest before um uh president cleveland was thought to 
live in Cleveland Park or why Cleveland Park is what it is now because he lived over there, they were going to have him live in Hillcrest. And so it was good enough for him. So then, hey. <laughs> you know what, though? It's so true. I remember growing up, you were – you would hear the media about all of these things that are happening down there, Southeast yeah. or Southwest. And it, it was a lot of just negativity and, and people would just be afraid about going Absolutely. down there. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm not going there because all they would hear and see on the TV is all this stuff that's going on. Yeah. Um, and then it was, it was a different, it was an interesting space to be in as a producer. Right. And like choosing and working for an all news radio station. And I'm trying to like, find stories specifically like to send my reporters out in the southeast to create like a better light and also like literally fighting against people not thinking it was worthy to talk about like really fighting i'm like this is my community people care about this and then like knowing who my listeners were at the time they were me like they were black women that were between the ages of 25 and 35 and i was like i know what i want to hear about mm -hmm. and some of those things were happening in southeast and it was like really having to fight and advocate for southeast so it's just like I guess that's my purpose. That is what I've been set here to do is to fight for Southeast, baby. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it, it's just about what, what, what you're not exposed to, because I, I even remember, you know, growing up in D.C., my school, we would, it would pull from all different wards and neighborhoods. So you would have kids from Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest. And it, it was such a diverse, you know, population of children that yeah. – you almost had no choice making friends. Well, I guess I'm speaking to my, for myself here, yeah. making friends with people. I remember just having, being friends with people from Southeast, Southwest and whatever. And it, it was like nothing going yeah. to school with them. Um, we just lived in a different mm -hmm. neighborhood and community. Uh, but yeah. yeah. And I think that's what my mother, my mother, I think that was what her, she just really wanted me to have that diverse and cultured experience. Right. And so I think that she spent so much time with me in terms of, and being very like, um strategic in terms of the spaces that she put me in so that i could have this well-rounded mind you, you mentioned earlier when when that incident happened with sean right Is yes, that sean. yeah yep. and you were in grad school and everything um where were you studying grad school so i end up uh getting um my master's in science management um, with a specialization in public relations, okay. which was actually really cool because I didn't realize, I just wanted to get to the public relations side, but I had to go through science management to get it. And I never even realized what it was until I was in there. And it was perfect because at that point I had started the center. And so science management was really teaching me about business management. And I was just like, oh, well, this is amazing. Okay. And I got to use like, and I got to use my art gallery and my organization as a lot of the case study that I was doing in school so it just it worked out really well oh that's great I, um, uh, yeah it, you were you were learning in school you could apply it firsthand um day to day exactly <laughs> exactly it was a little stressful too because i was just like a lot of it showed me that i didn't know it, it i had no idea what i was doing right it was just like because when it, you know when we go back to the story it's just like i had this vision we spent probably three or four months like getting it, making it real and making the center real. And then we opened one weekend and it was just like, okay, you're a founder and executive director of a nonprofit, do your thing. Because my father has his own business, right? And so it was just like, okay. And so now that I think about it, it's like, wow, I've literally been doing this for seven years and probably four of them was just off the cuff. And so, yeah, I learned a lot there um, in school. One about the things that, I needed to clean up um, and just be more effective and efficient with it. So it's definitely been a ride, <laughs> a ride. How, how was those first couple of years when you started it? Um, when I think about it now, like at that point, I was just on go mode and I was pregnant with my son. I was in school. I just was, I completely burnt myself out and you know, of course, there's, there's duality in everything, right? Light, dark, everything, mm -hmm. uh, negative, positive. And so for this whole COVID situation, the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of ne like negative things that came from that. A lot of people's families were affected. Um, but for me, I was so grateful to have a moment to sit down, to shut down. Like I could close the doors and like really get my mind together for a moment because like I said I was just heads down I was raising kids I was running the art gallery I was trying to get my degree and then all of a sudden I realized like I am literally killing myself 
myself for the most part. And so I think in the pandemic, I, one, got to tap back into myself, right? And so that's where I was able to get back into my full-time artistry, um, was really able to figure out what boundaries look like, right? What balance looks like so that I didn't get back into that overdrive and that burnout stage. Um, and so, yeah, those first years, when I look back on it, they were really, really hard, but they also taught me a lot, um, of like, again, again, about balance where I'm just like, now there's burnout is not happening. Like I know about like, okay, I will answer your call later. I will email you when I get back to it. I stretch my schedule out a little bit more. So it's just not, I don't have to put this tomorrow. Like I'm more thoughtful about it because I recognize, you know, you have to have a full cup in order to pour out. And there's no way that I can do that if I'm not filling myself up. Right. And so, yeah, it's, whew, it's been a ride. <laughs> I keep saying that, but it has been because now you're having me like, think about it at all and now you know like when you're in your business you're just yeah. doing it yeah, yeah. It, it, it's true a, a lot of times in the business we're, we're in the business and sometimes we take very few times to work on it and just observe from the top looking down yeah give ourselves like some kudos give ourselves some grace for like, how long like how hard we're putting it because this entrepreneurship life is it's not easy it is not easy I'm glad though COVID sounds like it helped you personally a lot to sort of yeah, just definitely. take that break mentally and physically as well yeah. that was needed. Yeah. How, how did it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Oh yeah, I was just saying that it. it um, one of my main brands. Sorry, listeners, you can't see it either, but it's face yourself right there, which is really about accountability, right? like being accountable for yourself, but also what you're allowing to come into your space and like really have on a full reflection of self. Um, and that's definitely what the, the pandemic for me, it like put myself in front of the mirror and was like, girl, you got to get this together. <laughs> well, what about the center that the center during that time that it closed? Yeah, we completely shut down. Um, like I said, I didn't want to fight with the the fight of trying to make our vibe virtual. Like I just didn't mm -hmm. want to do that. Um, and I didn't, I just didn't want to put extra stresses on myself. Right. So there's other things that I focused on for the center, which was going for all the relief grants that was out. I mean, we wrote our tails off to get relief money. Um, and there was a lot of grants that came out through events, DC events, DC. We got one of the biggest grants that we've gotten to date and was able to renovate our center while um, it was shut down. We got new floors and uh, new hanging systems, new lights, like things that we really, really needed. Um, new signage outside. Um, and then, yeah, the COVID relief grants that came out, we were able to keep payroll running for some of our grant writers that we have. Um, and for me, of course. And yeah, it was just, yeah, the center surprisingly came out of the pandemic way better than it went into it. That's good. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, thank you. What advice would you give someone if they came to you and said, oh my God, this is amazing. I want to do something similar like that in my community. What are some pointers? Um, definitely a plan. Like, even if it's not an official, like business plan, have a plan. Um, I'm grateful that, you know, spirit manifested this and it came, but to run off cuff is very hard to do. Right. And then when you do that, you create a bunch of org this organization that you'll have to go back and clean back later. Like literally, uh, yesterday I started organizing my files on my computer from 2015. Right. So I have seven years worth of files that I need to clean up, um, and reorganize because a lot of it is like, we've been doing all this work, but how do we show it? Right. When mm -hmm. we go to these grants and we've written all these grants, why are we rewriting things? Like it needs to be a copy and paste. We need to be able to pull things out of a file. So definitely having a plan because it just keeps you organized moving forward. Um, definitely if you want to be in community you have to be in community right so you have to talk to community you have to see what they want see what they need see what they don't like see what they don't want because a lot of times people come into community even if you are part of community and you're already there you're just giving people what you think they want right you're not loving them how they want to be loved so i think it's very important to really put yourself um in the space really talk to people um be engaged listen um thoughtfully have good intentions with everything um, and I think lastly, I would say just have grace with yourself, right? Take your time, um, pace yourself. It's not, it's not a rush, right? Um, 
yeah, just pace yourself and take your time and give yourself grace. Like we are our biggest critics and, but we are also doing the work, right? And so we have to be graceful with ourselves in that. Speaking of being in the community, how was it when you first opened? How was the community? How did they take it? Um, it was interesting. So my father is kind of a, a legend um, in these parts, Mr. Finest Jones. Um, and so for a while, I was in his shadow. Um, but I was also t- leveraging that shadow, like I'm Finest Jones's daughter, and we opened an art gallery, right? So mm-hmm. it was a lot about just like getting people used to seeing me. Um, because I had like, again, I was like, I'm born and raised here, but I wasn't necessarily like in the streets, like grassroots, like you were saying. So just being there and like all of a sudden showing up and saying, yeah, I got this, I got this. Like, girl, who are you? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the other part about Southeast is that because of what the, like what we talked about earlier, all that negative stuff that people hear and say, we're very defensive, right? And we're very protective, especially with the developments and gentrification. And we're seeing this displacement of our neighbors and everything. We are very protective of like who comes into our space so I had to make people feel comfortable with me and remind them like I'm from here don't even worry about it you don't have to be scared I'm south side too um so it took a lot a little bit of that but now like I'm introducing my father to people right and then some people are like I'm introduced the center is coming before me now which is super cool because I'm like yeah I have an art gallery in southeast and it's like that house on the corner I'm like yeah that's me um (laughs) so it's definitely like I said just having grace um and having the patience to see everything grow you have to plant the seeds you have to water it you have to take time to cultivate it's like a garden right it takes time and so now we're just seeing the garden is blooming and I, yeah. i'm excited <laughs> that's good but it, it, it's true though you're you're seeing it and now you're seeing it more as far as certain areas in dc being gentrified and being redeveloped and what was happening and you probably even now most of the people were moving to pg pg prince george's county um, or nine, we call it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, you know, that, that was part of the reason, too. You know, I did elementary and junior high school in D.C. And then we moved. And then I did high school in Maryland. We, we moved to okay. Prince George's County. Um, okay. it, it was that was just one of the many things. I wasn't doing so well in school and was going a different direction. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad they pulled me out and, and things changed immediately uh, once that yeah. happened to me. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you turned it around too, all that. Man. <laughs> are, are there any specific habits or traits you feel that you have that helped you, whether for you personally or for the organization? Um, I think, first of all, I just, I don't give up too easily. Like, so I think just like my, um, what's the word for that? Um, my diligence. Um, I also, I'm Greek. I also pledged. Um, I'm a Delta, Delta Sigma Theta. Um, so I think just going through that process also taught me a lot um, just about endurance um, because it takes a lot of endurance. Sometimes there's late, very, very late nights. There's very, very early morning. Sometimes there's all nighters. Um, so being able to push through that and having the mental to stick with me, like mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter type situation. Um, and so I think probably that's the biggest thing. And then again, just my love for Southeast. It's just, it's what keeps me going. Like I can't, I can't stop. I just can't. You can't stop. You won't stop. I know. Right. And the crazy part is like, I do have a, I do have a vision in the future to leave DC because I feel like, um, even in my own artistry, art is very healing for me, right? And I feel like that is also just what we're doing in, in the community. Um, and I think people are recognizing that in art itself, period. Um, I was I had the honor of being one of the seven artists to paint the Black Lives Matter mural in front of the White House. And I think that is what just sold me on this whole art thing. After 24 hours, that thing was replicated all over the world. And I mean, in countries that, you know, the same exact thing. And I'm like, this is the force of what art has. Like, this is the spread. This is the power. This is the healing and the change that it can have, right? And so um, I really see myself being bigger than D.C., right? I always see myself coming home and, and, and working for Southeast. But I just feel like art has, I just have to move all over the world with the art. Um, 
So it's interesting. Yeah, I definitely will never stop fighting for Southside, but I definitely recognize the fact that I won't always be here. Where would you want to live besides D.C.? I don't course? know yet, man. I don't know <laughs> yet. For some weird reason, Spirit keeps like whispering Texas in my ear. Um, and so last year I checked it out and I actually really liked it, but their laws are kind of going crazy. So I'm not too sure about that one. Um, and then I, I really don't know. I, I just kind of let spirit lead me and try to figure out what I would do. Um, Florida is pretty cool too, um, especially the art scene down there, but push come to shove. Like I would love to retire and go to Jamaica. Like I need to be out of the U S at some point. So that's like long-term, long-term, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are moving down to Texas and Florida. I know, man. I don't know if it's going to be me, though, but we'll see. <laughs> what would you say is your biggest challenge with your role today? Um, right now, I think it's kind of the balance of my my full time artistry and like how much um, how much I can be involved in the center um, and just like keeping that balance because I still am a one woman band. Right. So just keeping the balance between both of them, because I am a full time artist now, like I do tattoos, I do murals, I'm on canvas, I'm doing about a little bit of everything um, and got a nice size gigs that are happening in the city. So like balancing the two, um, but also it's sometimes like an easy balance because I end up just taking the center with me. So if I'm talking about myself, then I end up just talking about the center and then bringing other artists. So, yeah, I think it's just really about the balance. Um, and then now kicking up programming again, like trying to get our like our, our pace back up after the pandemic. Um, so yeah, that. You, you have such a rich history. Knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have done differently? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I probably definitely would have at least gotten one more other like full-time staff to bounce things off with. Um, I definitely would probably consider that for sure. Um, and anything else, I don't know. I can't say that I would. I know, like, my advice was to have a plan. And so that may have been nice. But I also feel like the way I moved, just the spirit leading me, was how it was supposed to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't question that. But, yeah, I probably would have put somebody else on my team, give me some help. <laughs> You mentioned uh, your father, your partners a couple times. Is there yeah. any big mentors you've had throughout your life, whether him or anyone else? And if so, what did you learn from them? Um, definitely my father, I would for sure say. Um, he moved here from Mississippi in 63 and has always been um, an entrepreneur, um, connected with the city. I grew up with Marion Berry being my uncle. Um, and so just being able to, and, and his love for the city. I don't know where, like where that love came from. And like specifically Southeast, he talks about this story about how he came to DC and how he went to the, um, the top of the monument. And he just looked all over the city and was like, where am I gonna go? And he like looked at Northwest and was like, ah, that's kind of too built up. And went to all the, like all the parts of the city and saw Southeast is un, like underdeveloped and untouched. And he was like, that's where I'm going. And I mean, when he came, he just dug his feet in. And I think that's really where I get the love from. Like, again, growing up around Marion Barry, my parents met in the city council. So like just being in that whole space, um, I think that's really what gave me one, the love and the vigor for Southeast. And then seeing his entrepreneurial spirits and how he's like always, he got old country things. He says like, don't take it with nickel or, you know, weird stuff like that. But it also, it was just telling me that it's like, you have to work, you have to take care of yourself and you can't put it on somebody else. Right. Um, and so I think that I, the entrepreneurial spirit definitely from him, cause my mom is still telling me to this day, go get a job. And I'm just like, okay, I, I think I have one, but all right. Yeah. Um, but then also I learned a lot from my mother too, just about, um about patience about pure intentions um about doing things for the good reason my mother's just like that sweetest little soul um she's very conservative and you know in her corner my mom my dad's very loud and outspoken so just having like both of them i think um and then also i was just so different from them and so i think also like the bickering that we had, we've like now just come into a, a, a calm space <laughs> where we have like this good talking relationship and everything because 
I think we just fought so much because I was so different and I just wanted to be me. I wanted to do the things that I wanted to do. And I really got that from my father too. And it was like, they wanted me to do this. And it was like, no. And I think that push also shaped a lot of who I am too, right? Um, other mentors. Kiana, do you have any siblings by the way? I do have siblings. Um, okay. My father has actually, my mother, I lost a brother when I was three, and then my father has two children, my oldest siblings, um, my sister and my brother. Yeah, okay. so I'm the baby, actually. Okay, yeah. you're the youngest one. Yeah, and that's the crazy part. My father always wanted his children to work with him or for him. Uh -huh. um, my sister tried it. Mm -mm, that did not work well. <laughs> and my, my brother's around every now and then. Um, he does, like, some part-time work between me and my father. Um, he kind of does his own thing. So I'm like the baby that really does it. And I'm just like, dad, hello, do you see me? And yeah. but my dad's, he's, he, yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> do you, do you have any family still down in Mississippi? You said that's where he came up here from? Yeah, actually all my family, we're pretty much the only one that are, are here in DC. Okay. Um, all my family is either in North Carolina or Mississippi. I have a few, uh, some family in Wisconsin, random. Um, but yeah, most, most of us are still in the South. Yeah, but very, very different here than the, uh, the, the D.C. area compared yes, to the South. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, and I think that's part of it, too, right? I'm the only one born and raised in Southeast, and they're like, you know, little baby country bumpkins, and they just think I'm just like the wildest thing that they've ever seen. But <laughs> <laughs> Coming to an end here soon, what yeah, does no. the future look like for you and the center? What is the next couple of years? Yeah, so we are actually um, in a couple of different programs right now that's doing capacity building. Um, my dream is to create artist housing. Um, so that's what I'm working, like that's my next goal is to find a space that we can house at least four to six artists um, and then funnel them into the art gallery. We have a space where they can work, live and do their thing and then funnel them into the art gallery for an exhibition or something. But that is definitely my dream. But other than that, we're just gonna keep on what we've been doing. I mean. We've been pretty successful. And like I said, excited to get back to programming um, and seeing what that looks like, more collaborations. We're doing more collaborations with the city and other nonprofits. We've got new spaces, plenty of new spaces that are building in our area around Congress Heights. Um, the St. E's development is coming. So we're hoping to do a lot of activation there. So yeah, we got a lot of stuff coming. I'm excited. We got things in the works. That's awesome. You, yes. you, I, I just remembered a comment you mentioned earlier as far as having artists that aren't starving. And you always hear that sort of stereotype, that statement thrown out yeah. there. Um, is, it, is it easy or how easy or difficult it is because being a successful artist and being able to sort of live on your own and still be able to do art full time? Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely tricky, especially living in this city. Um, one with the politics and two with the housing crisis like it's, it's very hard um and so trying to balance the two and making sure that you have you know the money for the supplies and then finding the right people that are going to buy your art um it's really tricky but you just really got to believe in yourself and you have to work i mean you have to get out there you have to network you have to talk to people you need to get in shows you need to visit other people's shows and just figure out how you can get in because there's a, especially in dc there, there are a lot of resources and because the mayor is tapping into you know this creative economy she's supporting it there's grants like everywhere the arts and humanities commission is how we how we um keep our doors open for the most part like literally i have a grant that i'm applying for that's due on friday um, so it's definitely hard, but it is possible. It is definitely possible. Starving artists is a myth. Do not believe it. Um, even if you have to go outside on the streets and sell your art, right? If you have to pull out a table and, and do some own vending yourself, you can do it. You can do it. It, it, it's, it's so true. It's, it's like running your business. And, and some people just Absolutely. see it more just the artistic side. Um, and just focusing yeah. on the art. But there is the business side of things. Like you mentioned, you got to promote yourself. You have to put yourself out there. Um, yeah, it, it yeah just, I call it archer. I call it entrepreneurship. It's like entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship, you have to do it. And I mean, I think that's also where a lot of artists get lost in it because we create off passion. Right. And so a lot of us are just stuck in being a passionate artist rather than being a professional artist. And we have to figure out how we get our profits from our passions. Yeah, exactly. You know, it just brought me memories when 
you know, there's some musicians and, you know, there's artists out there and they would, they would have to go on streets and start selling their tapes back then when there were tapes exactly. or this new track came out or whatever it is, because they were getting to play on the radio station. This is exactly. obviously before Spotify and all this stuff we right. online, but you would just have to hit the streets and go sell out of the trunk of the car, wherever it is. Exactly. And you see the street performers in New York all the time and it's train and everything. Get your quarters how you can, people. You can do it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. Where can people find out more information about you and the center? Yeah, for sure. So my personal information, I am KMJ6 everywhere. That is spelled K-A-Y-E-M-J-A-Y, the number six. So that's dot com. That's on Instagram. That's uh, Twitter. And for the um, the art gallery, we are Congress Heights Arts and Cultural Center. So it's our acronym, C-H-A-C-C dot org. And we are C-H-A-C-C underscore D-C on Instagram and Twitter. So just type in C-H-A-C-C and you'll find us. Some people call us chalk. If you're listening and you're watching, please don't call us that. Call us the center. I hate chalk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for coming on today. Really yeah, no, thank it. you. I appreciate it. It was a great conversation. You had engaging questions. You have a great vibe, great energy. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Take care. All right. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.